Woodcraft since 1928, providing traditional and modern woodworking tools and supplies to generations of craftsmen. Woodcraft, helping you make wood work. Hi, come on in. My name is Rick Boots. Welcome to wood carving. Just putting the finishing details on one of my favorite animals, an eastern chipmunk. This is the kind of guy that I have who sits out on my porch and suns himself, and this is the one I use for a model. Really cute little guy, very inoffensive, one of my favorites. Let me show you how we get started with this guy. He's made from a block of air dried white pine with the tail being carved separate and then fitted to the body. And that way you can carve some of the more delicate details without having the wood getting in the way. Let me show you how to get started with this guy. Started out with a block of white pine. You can also use basswood for this too. And then I was watching my chipmunk who sits out my front porch in the sun and suns himself. They also come to the bird feeder. And from these observations, I took and I drew a sketch of the profile, transferred that to the wood, just traced around it, and then cut out my piece of wood. Now, one of the problems you're going to have with this is, in carving this guy, remember the other day we were talking about laying out your pattern with the wood grain so that the delicate parts of the grain, or the delicate parts of the carving, go the length of the wood grain. You can see in this piece, the wood grain goes this way. Now, I've got a little problem here because the ears go one way and his feet go at 90 degrees to that. So I've got to kind of make a choice here. One of these is going to have to go with a short grain. In this case, I decided to leave the feet going with a short grain. Even though they'll be fragile, they'll be sitting on a stump, so that'll give it some extra support. The ears would be the easiest to break off, so that's where I went with a long grain. Besides, with the grain going this direction, it'll make it easier to carve up around the back and do the detailing on the hands as opposed to if the grain had been going that way. And when we're carving him, we'll be carving along this way with a grain, down this way, coming up along here. The ears will come up from either side. For, from his nose, we'll be coming up this direction and then down that direction. For his hands, we'll be working downhill on each side. And of course, with his feet, we'll just be going across this way. Now, as this is going to be the end grain here, we'll have to be extra careful when we're carving that. But I'll show you some tricks for doing that so it doesn't cause any real problems. Now, the other problem we have is with the tail. I gave this guy kind of a cute little fluffy tail, sort of stuck up in the air. Now, sometimes if it's real cold, my chipmunk will take and he'll drape his tail over his feet to keep his feet warm. But as it's kind of sunny and warm today, he's got his tail sort of perked up and he sort of twitches it around. So I'm going to carve it with the tail in the upright position. And the tail has a little bit of an S curve to it. And that presents some problems with the wood grain as well. Because we're going to be using the grain going the lengthwise for most of the tail. But when we, when we get into some of these turns here, we're going to be going across the grain. So this is going to be a little fragile. We'll be carving around this way and carving around this way to work with the grain there. When we come down to the base of the tail here, we'll be coming around this way with the grain and we'll have to carve this way. If we go the other way, we'll be digging into the wood and causing splinters. Now once again, we have this problem where this section of the tail is going to be going short grain. So I'll keep that a little bit thicker so even though it's fragile, It'll probably, you know, being a little thicker wood, it'll still be somewhat sturdy unless the, the total carving's dropped or something. So, this is a good project because it'll be using a lot of the different patterns that we've been uh, working with and a lot of the different techniques and so forth. 
To start it, I'm just going to take my knife and start whittling away. I'm using our favorite paring cut here, where you take and you brace your thumb against the block of wood, and then just close your fingers and watch those curls come. This is a fun little project. I love chipmunks, they're really neat. They live in burrows underground, and these burrows are sometimes as long as 12 feet long. And they have a lot of different rooms in them. They have a room for sleeping, and they have a pantry where they store the seeds. Usually they like beech nuts, or if you have a bird feeder, and you put out sunflower seeds, they'll come and they'll carry off all your sunflower seeds and store them in their room. And in some of these chipmunk burrows, they can fit like a half a bushel of grain in their storage room. And that's their pantry. They also have a room where they toss all the hulls, sort of a dump. And they also have several entrances in and out of their burrows. Now, they don't exactly hibernate in the winter. It's not a real deep hibernation like a, a bear. They'll sort of partially hibernate, and they'll sleep for a while and then wake up and eat. They usually spend the winter sleeping on top of their food pile. It's kind of interesting about chipmunks in that apparently everyone has sort of had the same feeling about them. Even the Indians uh, had taboos against hurting chipmunks. They wouldn't hunt them. And the Iroquois even had a superstition that if uh, one of the children of the village came and complained about his nose itching, mothers would say, oh, you've been out teasing the chipmunks again. The Hopi Indians uh, actually have a kachina for the chipmunk, a chipmunk spirit dancer. And when they're doing certain festival dances, they'll have somebody dressed up with a big chipmunk mask dancing around with the different snakes and the wolves and the eagles and everything else. But the biggest enemy of chipmunks is cats. And cats uh, can do a number on chipmunk population. Because sometimes the chipmunks aren't real smart. Now, I've got one that comes to my bird feeder outside my window every year. And I call him Stubby because he's got a real short tail. And that's where he got too close to a cat or a hawk or something. And this same chipmunk's been around for about five years now. I think he's a little. Uh, Sadder but wiser. Maybe, actually, he's probably happier and wiser. But he's got this short tail, so it's easy to tell him from the others. Now, for doing these arms around here, what I've done is I've just taken and made a notch down with my knife, then a notch up from the underside. And suddenly, that gives us his little front arms there or paws, or whatever you would call it on a chipmunk. And I'll flip it around and do the other one from the other side here. I always wondered how chipmunks got their names. And until one day, I heard this noise out in the woods that I'd always thought was a bird. And I realized a chipmunk was making. And he's just sitting on the stump going, chip, 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 chip. I did a little research on that, and it turns out that naturalists have been studying that phenomenon, and they thought at first the chipmunks were doing it for some sort of a mating call, and then they thought, well, because he's doing it all the time, they thought maybe he was advertising his territorial rights. And finally, what they decided was the chipmunk was just out there making that call because he was happy. He'd go out in the sun on a log, and he'd just go out there and go chip, 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 chip. So that's why they call them chipmunks. I don't know where they get the monk, but that's where they get the chip. Now, for doing the feet, we're going to have to be a little bit careful here because we're dealing with this cross grain. Remember the other day I showed you how I could take a piece of this cross grain and just break it off real easy. So I have to be careful here. And what I've done is I've started making a notch from either side coming in towards the bottom. And that will give us a good chance to widen out this area between his toes, or between his feet, 
without breaking off the pieces. If you should happen to put too much pressure on this and it does snap off, then just take a little glue, a little white glue like Elmer's or Tight Bond or something, and just glue it back on. Then after it's set up, you can just continue to carve it. Now for carving across this way, we can go either way because we're dealing cross grain here. And I probably shouldn't have taken out quite such a big chip, but I was lucky and the wood didn't split. Normally, you'll just want to be taking out very tiny chips in here. Well, anyway, and so on. You just work that down until you get to the shape that you want. Now, for doing around his tummy here, that's going to be a tricky area to get your knife into. So what you can do is take a small gouge, well, like a number five. This is an eight millimeter number five. And you can take and just kind of work that in there to smooth out that little area on his tummy between his haunches. And so on. So that won't give any problem. Now what does get a little tricky is carving his front feet. Now you notice on this guy here, over in the one I've done, let me just turn that a bit. I've carved his paws, so he's kind of holding them sort of tucked around under his chin. This is sort of your classic chipmunk pose. And that's the position I'm doing this guy in. And to do that, we just do it with a series of notches. We'll start out under his chin here. I'll make a notch down and come up from the other side. Make another notch. The trick to doing this is, remember, work out your general shapes first. We're going to work out the shapes of his, his uh, sort of the total mass of the arms and the wrist before we even worry about the, the location of the toes. Now I'll make another one down here. Come around and make one from the opposite direction. Then I'll make one to show the edge where his fingers are. Make another cut down there. So basically, this is like chip carving. I'm just using a series of chips to shape the wood. And then for the center part, we'll just take and make a notch down the middle there. And that comes around like so. Just round off the angles, and it gives us the general shape of the paws. Then it's just a simple matter of coming through, tapering this down a little bit, and that will f form the position as if he's sitting there with his finger sort of curled up under. Now when you get done, you're going to have something that looks, well, sort of like this. And this is the position of the paws, and it's sort of been carved under on either side there. So it looks like he's got his little hands tucked under. Now for carving the ears, I did the same thing as I did with those feet. I just took and started a notch in between here, and then just widen it out until I could get the knife in to bring it up to the end there. And we can't go down this way because this is against the grain, so you have to make enough space to go across and then bring it up to the tips of his ears. Now for the eyes, 
I use the same technique like we did the other day with the chickadee. I see, where did I put that glass eye? Here we go. I use a little glass eye like this. And these are the ones you can buy from different uh, wood carving or decoy carving supply houses. Then I painted the back with acrylic paint so it was brown to match the color of his eye. Then just take a small gouge. This is a, a small one that I found in a block, a wood uh, block cutting kit. And just cut around there they have a hole large enough to set that glass eye in. Then just take some wood dough or epoxy putty and work that around there with a toothpick and a little water. And that'll give you, a, you know, the shape of the eyelid. And while I've got this tool in my hand, I can also do the ear. And to do the ear, he's got a little earlobe there and a little indentation. I'll just take and press that tool right down into the wood, making two small stop cuts. And then just take and very carefully pare away a little bit of wood to hollow out the inside of the ear. You'll want to fudge just a little bit on these ears. You're not going to want to make these as thin as a real chipmunk's because they're going to be awfully fragile. So just do a little bit of detailing down the middle here to show that there's a hollow spot where the sound can get to the chipmunk. And then leave the edges kind of thin and that'll make the whole ear look like it's thin. For doing the detailing around the toes, you can notch those out with a knife. But a little better way is to take a three millimeter V tool. And this is a very small tool that has two vertical sides that form a, a V. And this will cut a nice little grooved line. We'll just come up here. This will have to be sharp because you're going across the end grain there. And just carve along and just do his toes. Incidentally, chipmunks have five toes, just like people. Now, for doing his front paws, just do the same thing. And just take the V tool, make a little cut down there. And that will give us his little chipmunk fingers. They're very agile with their fingers. They can pick out seeds real easily with them. Then we just repeat that for the other side. Same thing for the mouth. We can just take the V tool and shape around and shape around his mouth. Now, for texturing the fur, what I find works the best is using a wood burning pen. Let me show you how that works. This is the one that I use. And this is a control box with a rheostat. You just turn it on and you can adjust the heat very to a very sensitive degree. And then it's just a matter of taking the pen and etching in the hair lines. You can vary the texture of this fur by how long or how short you make the lines. Now along his back here and on his tail, the fur is going to be reasonably long. But like when you get up around his face, you'll be making much shorter strokes because the fur is much shorter around his muzzle and his eyes. You could also cut these lines with a small V tool or scratch them in with a knife. But if you have access to a wood burner, it really gives a much finer detail. And so on. You just go along and texture uh, your chipmunk. Now, the last thing I need to mention about this guy is how to fit his tail on. You'll notice that when I started him here, I took and I've got a little notch here for his tail. And that was just made with a vayner. This is a five millimeter number 11 vayner. And it's a U-shaped tool. 
It's called a vayner, incidentally, because the old European woodcarvers centuries ago used to use it for cutting the lines in leaves to simulate the, uh, the, uh, the veins in the oak leaves, the Gothic carving. So this vayner name goes back centuries and centuries because that's what they used to make leaves. Anyway, you just take, and with your vayner, cut out a little notch there. Then when you're carving your, your tail, I'll just rough this down a little bit here. You just bring your tail down, the, the, the base of the tail down to a point. Or not exactly a point, but you bring it down to where it'll fit inside that little notch we cut into the chipmunk's back. The yeah, tail goes pretty quickly here. And you just round off the edges here. This is a fun project because you can take your knife and your block of wood and go out and sit on your porch and watch chipmunks and have a lot of fun. You can carry it off into the woods with you. I think that's the one thing that's really neat about doing wildlife carving is to really get the flavor of the, the particular animal. It's always good to go out and take a look at them. And the more you look at the, the wildlife around you, the more you begin to see things and understand it and appreciate the different personalities and the actions of the different uh, birds and animals and wildlife where you live. And it just sort of opens up a whole new area of relaxation. It's just something very, very relaxing about going out in the woods and spending an afternoon just watching the things running around. And it just, I don't know, there's just something that's very relaxing about it. I find it very soothing to, to get out in the woods and do a little just watching the wildlife. Also, it's a good idea because it rests your eyes from doing, if you're doing a lot of carving and close up work, getting out and being able to see things gives your eyes a chance to rest and it's a good excuse to get out. So, for fitting the tail on, we'll just shape this end down here until it'll fit into that notch. And we can make the notch a little wider too if we need. Just come to a compromise until that'll fit in there. And then you'll come up with something that, well, that looks kind of like this. See how this just sort of fitted right in there and it blends right in. Now to paint your chipmunk, I used acrylic on this guy. And I used um, burnt sienna and a little burnt umber and yellow ochre, just earth colors to do the body here. And then I mixed a little white in there and thinned it down with the orange I had. And it gives you sort of a little whitish color for his tummy and under his chin. I used my paints very thin in painting this. And that way the dark lines from the burning in marks show through and it also sort of enhances the illusion of the fur texture. Now when you're painting the stripes on your chipmunk, you'll want to, um, well, you want to keep your hands out of the paint. <laughs> uh, when you're painting your stripes on your chipmunk, you're going to have to be aware that different chipmunks have different color stripes. For example, the eastern chipmunk has one white stripe with a black stripe on either side and a black stripe down the middle. But then a chipmunk, like the lodgepole chipmunk, which you find out west, has an extra white stripe in there. And also the stripes around the face are going to vary. And then put your stripes on. You just take and use a very fine, this is a number one brush, very fine hairs. And just paint all those hairs right in. The nice thing about using this acrylic paint is you can thin it down with water and it dries quickly. And so on. And just paint your chipmunk to match your local chipmunk. Now the other thing I want to mention here is doing the whiskers. After you get this guy all painted up, it looks nice to put some whiskers on him. And the way I do that is I don't use real chipmunk whiskers. 
get an old bristle paintbrush. And you just take your brush and take a knife and snip off a few bristles here. Oh, there's one right there. And then take a small needle. This one is mounted on a plastic or a little metal stick here. It's uh, called a bodkin. It's used for tying fishing flies. Or you can just glue a needle into a stick. You take your chipmunk and just to the point of the needle drill a little hole there. Then mix up some epoxy glue, put a little drop in there. Take your whisker with a pair of tweezers and just set that in the glue and hold it until it dries. Usually just take a minute or two. And then just trim them down to the length when you're done. And that gives you your chipmunk. Next week, we're going to be getting out the mallets and doing a lot of bashing with the mallets and the gouges. I'd like to show you a little bit about sign carving, how to lay out letters and how to match a lettering style to suit the particular sign that you're going to be working on. And we'll be doing a name sign for a cabin that uh, belongs to a friend of mine. And I'll show you a little bit about some of the ins and outs of doing sign carving. So, thanks for dropping by, and until next time, this is Rick Boots wishing you happy carving. You can continue to learn wood carving with Rick Boots with his book, How to Carve Wood. This 224-page book of challenging exercises and projects is full of detailed instructions. Lessons include whittling, wildlife carving, and relief carving. To order your copy, call 1-800-950-9648. Woodcraft, for all your woodworking needs, tools, supplies, lumber, project plans, and educational workshops. With a mail order catalog and stores nationwide. Woodcraft, helping you make wood work.